Could blood flow to your brain be the reason why hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not working for you? In this video, we're gonna be taking a look at another video about hyperbaric and why hyperbaric may not be working for people. And throughout the video, I'll just be responding to various points along the way, discussing how hyperbaric actually works, and then addressing any misconceptions that may come out during the course of the video. Could blood flow to your brain be the reason why hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not working for you? It's a really important question and it's one we got today in the clinic, so it's worth talking about. Let's start with what is the benefit of using HBOT or hyperbaric oxygen? Well, number one, it allows us to be able to take advantage of the Bohr effect. And what that means is we can use pressure to be able to increase the amount of carrying capacity of oxygen on a hemoglobin. What does that mean? It means that like per red blood cell, per hemoglobin molecule, you can cram more oxygen onto it. So depending on what your background is and your knowledge around biology and physiology, let's just catch up to where we started, which is red blood cell carrying capacity is essentially what he's talking about. So overall, your red blood cells are a very unique type of cell. They don't have a nucleus, they don't have a mitochondria, they don't replicate, they don't create proteins. Their literal entire job is carrying oxygen essentially to working cells and tissues, capturing carbon dioxide, bringing that back to the lungs, expelling any carbon dioxide, which in this setting is really just considered to be metabolic waste product, collecting more oxygen and delivering it. So in general, of course, red blood cells have a certain capacity or amount of oxygen that they're even capable of carrying. Of that total capacity, there's only a certain amount that they actually deliver to working cells and tissues at any given time. And then different environmental stimuli or situations affect how much oxygen can be carried, how much oxygen can be delivered, things like acidity levels, overall pressure, total CO2 levels, temperature, workload, of number of varieties can shift in one direction or the other what's called the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve. And the Bohr effect helps us to understand some of those relationships, which is what he's talking about right here. If you've got circulation and we want to be able to help cells heal, if we can get more oxygen per unit of blood, then we can push it further into the system. That can be very, very useful for healing. Oxygen, of course, is a very critical ingredient to almost all cell processes that go on inside your body. And your ability under normal conditions to pull oxygen from your environment and deliver it to working cells has everything to do with gradients. In other words, the pressure of oxygen in the air that you're breathing has to be higher than the pressure of oxygen in your lungs. The pressure of oxygen in your lungs has to be higher than the pressure of oxygen in your returning circulation. The pressure of oxygen on those red blood cells has to be higher than that of the cells it's delivering it to. The pressure of oxygen in the cells that it's delivering to has to be higher than the pressure of oxygen in the mitochondria, which is really where it has to go in the first place. And as long as there's a pressure gradient at each of those steps, we can drive oxygen from one location to the next. All of oxygen movement throughout our body from our environment into the mitochondria is based on pressure gradients. The higher the pressure or the higher the gradient, the more we can drive. Right now, as you're watching this video, assuming that you're being exposed to normal atmospheric pressure and you're not inside of a hyperbaric chamber, you're almost carrying as much oxygen as you could possibly carry. In other words, if we put a pulse oximeter on your finger, it should read 97, 98, 99% saturation, meaning at best, you could hold another one to 3%, but most likely you're about as saturated as you could possibly be, meaning red blood cells right now are already carrying the maximum amount of oxygen that they're capable of carrying. So one of the things he said earlier was we can cram more oxygen into the red blood cell. We're talking very, very little percentages that could possibly be driven onto that red blood cell based on the increased pressure. When we're talking about hyperbaric, we're not talking about red blood cell carrying capacity. We're actually bypassing red blood cell carrying capacity. And that's really what sets hyperbaric apart from essentially any other oxygen related therapy that we could think of. But like he said, oxygen is critical for repair and regeneration and tissue healing. So the more oxygen we can get, certainly the more we could upregulate those pathways inside of our body, improving performance or improving our capacity to heal. Great tool. But we'll find that for some people, that's just not been the effective thing. And one of the reasons to consider 
is one that we talk about quite a bit. We see a lot of people, especially people with autonomic problems, people that are dealing with post-concussion syndrome, that have impediments to actually getting blood from flowing from their heart to their head. And when we measure that with a transcranial Doppler, we can see the changes, especially for people when they do things like you know, standing up when they are moving and turning their head, these different types of inputs can impair the way that we are delivering blood flow to the head. So for a certain portion of that population, the simple question is, well, we know with HBOT, we're relying on that blood flow carrying more oxygen to push further into the tissue. But what happens if we actually have decreased the amount of cerebral blood flow? If that is true, and we have something that's an impediment to getting blood into your brain, then it doesn't really necessarily matter how much hemoglobin or how much oxygen is being carried on that hemoglobin. We're not able to get enough of that flow rate through to the system. So, so in many cases of any type of injury or trauma or even inflammation and toxicity, there are barriers to diffusion. And if there are barriers to diffusion, those barriers create obstacles for that pressure gradient to flow in the direction I was describing earlier. In addition to barriers to diffusion, there's probably capillary damage, which would absolutely impair the amount of flow of blood from one area to another, which essentially is what he's talking about. Agreed 100%. At the same time, under normal circumstances, we are relying on red blood cells to hold that oxygen and then red blood cells to deliver that oxygen. And in many cases, especially where there's capillary blockage or damage, those red blood cells cannot get through. If those red blood cells cannot get through, we cannot deliver oxygen from the red blood cell to the cell in need, creating hypoxia and then a number of downstream consequences of hypoxia. The reason that hyperbaric is so unique is that we are filling the red blood cells with oxygen, but now we're also super saturating the plasma. And while red blood cells may not be able to get through some of these areas of blockage or capillary damage, the plasma of the blood which typically has almost zero oxygen, can now act as a reservoir holding even tremendous amounts of oxygen, which will be able to actually get through most of those blockages or most of those damaged capillaries in the short term, delivering high enough levels of oxygen to help stimulate some activity, some repair, to reduce inflammation. But most importantly, one of the long-term benefits of hyperbaric is endothelial repair, which is the inside lining of your vascular system, and new capillary growth. So initially we start to hyperoxygenate the tissues because plasma is now saturated with oxygen, feeding and nourishing the tissues virtually almost immediately. And then long-term we're building and repairing the capillary network so that when we stop utilizing hyperbaric, the body can now naturally oxygenate on its own like it would have before these injuries even occurred. We'll get right back to that video, but real quick, if you're a practitioner or you're looking to get into hyperbarics and you're wanting to learn more and making sure that you're offering this therapy as effectively and as safely as possible, I want you to know that we offer a series of courses, some of which are online and some of which are in person. At the hbotcourse.com, we'll include a link below. We have several courses available from training and certification in hyperbaric medicine, safety director, as well as a few different business implementation options to get the business up and running. So if you think that training and education would be helpful for you, take a look at the hbotcourse.com. Again, the link will be in the description below. Now back to our video. It's kind of like we have boats that are full of supplies but there's something that's damming the river and we can't get them through. And if that's true, we wanna do things that allow that blood flow to be able to permeate again, to be able to get it flowing again, so that we can take advantage of the effects that we'd see with something like hyperbaric oxygen. So is it a bad tool? Absolutely not. It's one that we really promote here in the clinic, but we wanna make sure that we're not overlooking some of the just simple you know, blocking and tackling of being able to deliver oxygen we've got to be able to deliver blood too. So I hope that helps. So as I've said a number of times on this channel, hyperbaric is not the cure, nor should it be essentially used alone when dealing with most people's issues or trying to help people reach most of their health-related goals. That being said, we left this video with a thought of, well, hyperbaric is a great tool and potentially we will use it. However, there are these other issues or roadblocks or interferences with the ability to improve blood flow. I would be super interested to actually have a dialogue with him to understand what some of those other strategies are from the standpoint of first steps and roadblock removal to improve blood flow. 
I couldn't agree more that blood flow is actually the cause of a lot of these chronic symptoms associated with these injuries. And at the same time, I'm happy to share with you and would love to share with him that hyperbaric actually is one of the tools that does that. Because we're not relying on those red blood cells, because we're improving pressure gradients, which actually increases the driving force of oxygen into other cells and tissues, because the plasma will reach areas that red blood cells can't, because hyperbaric will actually stimulate new blood vessel and new capillary growth to feed those tissues and build new pathways for all of this blood to flow. And even one step further, which is when you get out of the chamber and you're no longer under pressure, the distance that oxygen can travel away from the capillary is up to four times further. In other words, there's some impact of hyperbaric while you're in the chamber, and then there's another impact of hyperbaric when you get out of that chamber. And so our ability to nourish all of this hypoxic tissue is really three different ways as a result of these hyperbaric exposures. And then long-term, fixing the actual cause of the problem, which was blockage of blood flow in the first place through new capillary growth. So I wanted to make sure that we clarified those concepts. Lastly, what I would say is the initial question was, why is it that sometimes we use hyperbaric and it doesn't seem to work? And the thought process in this video was, well, because there's blood flow blockages. I would also add, what is the actual problem? What is our actual goal? Are there other tools and strategies that need to be combined in order to get the impact? In other words, reducing inflammation, stimulating healing and repair and regeneration, mobilizing stem cells for further repair and regeneration, driving higher levels of cellular energy for growth, repair, and regeneration. And then once we've done some of those, holding that there for a period of time to allow for healing is what most people are going to need. But oxygen is only one of those ingredients. And so quite honestly, hyperbaric does what it does to everybody who goes into a chamber. The mechanisms of action, unless somehow a particular person defies the laws of physiology, oxygen has the impact that oxygen has. And at the same time, people need additional strategies like autonomic nervous system rehabilitation, additional strategies for reducing inflammation, maybe additional strategies for understanding someone's deficiencies and replacing those deficiencies, getting all of the ingredients that somebody needs put together and then offered to them for a period of time, allowing that healing to occur. And as a last thought, and quite honestly, my first question when I'm talking with somebody who says, I did try hyperbaric, it didn't work for me. My response to that is always, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What protocol did you follow? What was your pressure, percentage of oxygen, and then frequency and duration of sessions? Because if we tried hyperbaric in a way that was completely consistent with a program that would get the result that we were looking for, that would be one conversation. If we followed a protocol that was insufficient to actually reach the goals in the first place, and then we discontinued that therapy prematurely, well, how could we say that we actually tried it and it didn't work? We maybe didn't give it the chance that it needed. So I don't know the answer in this particular question, but that's always the question in the back of my mind is, okay, it's not working, but what pressure, what percentage of oxygen, how many sessions have we done, and over what period of time? Because that's the recipe for understanding how to get the most out of hyperbaric and ultimately get the result that you were hoping to get. Thanks so much for your time and attention, and I'll see you on the next video. Maybe you just bought your first chamber or your thinking about buying your first chamber. Maybe that's a home use chamber, or perhaps you're considering offering hyperbaric inside your clinic. And if you're anything like me when I first started, you're realizing how much information there is out there and you're concerned, are you doing this the right way? Are you being safe? How am I gonna utilize this hyperbaric chamber in the most effective way possible? If you're just getting involved in hyperbarics and you're looking for an introductory training program, the basic hyperbaric technician program is exactly what you need. In this course, we're gonna cover how does hyperbaric work? Why does hyperbaric work? What makes hyperbaric oxygen such a unique therapy? What mechanisms of action are taking place? What are the benefits of hyperbaric, both short and long-term? And what types of indications are appropriate to utilize hyperbaric for? We will also help build your confidence, not only in how to utilize the therapy, but how to talk about this therapy with patients or with other healthcare providers that may not understand hyperbarics the way you will once you finish this course. So if you're ready to dive in, click the link below this video and let's get started.